Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome. We certainly appreciate your spending your Thursday evening with us for the McSwain Third Thursday Trauma Talk. I am Mary McSwain, Executive Director of MTEP. I'm joined also by our treasurer, Steve Mercer, our physician at large, Ron Gross, and Madison Noble, who was our conference coordinator, who we would be paralyzed without. Um, we are extremely honored to have Dr. Bulger with us tonight. But if I may, before her presentation, give a few updates on MTEP and where we are. Next month, we will be in Brazil, hosting an MTEP conference in Sao Paulo. In June, we will be in Miles City, Montana. October in Chicago, partnering with the Region 8 Trauma Nurse Coordinators. Oh, uh, Omaha again um, in October for their second annual MTEP conference, as well in, as Cancun in December for their second annual. Um, I believe that we have for our second year as an upstart, we, we have been doing pretty well and getting the word out. Um, and have had great conferences these past two years. And thank you everyone for, for helping us to do that. If you think that your area could benefit by a McSwain Trauma Education Project conference, or if you need more information about what we do and what we provide, please don't hesitate to contact us through our website, um, mcswaintraumaedu.com. We would love to come to your area for a one-day trauma conference. <laughs> if you have any questions or want more information, please, please reach, out, reach out to us. We are here for you. Also, as a reminder that MTEP is a, is a nonprofit, a 501c3 nonprofit. All donations are tax deductible. Please consider our contribution to help us keep our doors open. Um, we are only able to provide this education um, through donations. No gift is too small and no gift is too large. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, if I may pass the baton on to Dr. Ron Gross, please. Good evening, all. Um, I have the privilege and the pleasure of introducing a friend and, uh, frankly, a mentor to many. Uh, Dr. Eileen Bulger. As you can see, uh, Eileen is the medical director for trauma programs of the American College of Surgeons, but there is so much more uh, to talk about. As a matter of fact, if you would all just buckle your seatbelts, please, because I have an 83-page CV to go through, so <laughs> hang tight. Just kidding. But I am going to talk about a little a little bit of uh, about Eileen and and who she is, where she's been. Eileen uh, got her BA from Hopkins, her medical degree from Cornell Medical College. She did her residency at the University of Washington. And by the way, while she was a resident, as we all know, residents don't work really hard. She did an NIH trauma research fellowship. Um, she did her fellowship for critical care at Washington. Um, she is currently a full professor at the University of Washington and Harborview University uh, Hospital. She is the surgeon in chief at Harborview and the chief of the division of trauma, burns and critical care. I went through Dr. Bulger's CV and I, let me just tell you that she is the invited reviewer for 24 journals. She's on the editorial board of seven journals. She is a site reviewer for the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. She is the current president of the AAST, the past president of the COT, the current trauma program manager, uh, director of trauma programs for the ACS. And what I would like to stress is the research component that we all have benefited from. Eileen has 30 funded research studies, eight of them NIH, totaling, totaling over $9 million of paid research to advance the studies of trauma and critical care. She has over 300 peer-reviewed publications, over 90 chapters, review articles and editorials, and over 340 invited presentations and lectures. Eileen, lastly, 
is one hell of a quilter. So if anybody wants a quilt, you could probably commission her and she might be able to do it in her spare time. Having said all of that, um, Eileen is a special person. I've never known her to say no when asked for help. I've never known her not to volunteer when help is needed. Um, and there are very few people um, that one could consider a true friend in the trauma world for anything and everything. Um, a teacher, a leader, a mentor, uh, but most importantly, a friend. I'd like to thank Dr. Bolger for being here tonight and take it away, Eileen. Well, thank you, Ron, for that incredibly kind introduction. And it is an honor for me to be here. Uh, I will do anything that has Norm McSwain's name attached to it. Uh, he was a hero for me as well and a mentor for me. Uh, I uh, was a paramedic before I was a physician. And uh, those are some of the best days of, of, of my medical career. I remember them very fondly. So it's guided a lot of what I've done on, a, on the research side is, is really think about how we advance pre-hospital care because it's such a critical linchpin in uh, the care of the trauma patient. So what I was going to talk about today are the new uh, national guidelines for the field triage of the injured patient. Uh, these were uh, uh, developed in 2021 in the middle of the pandemic uh, and published uh, early in 2022. So they're pretty new. Uh, and what I'd like to do is kind of go through the the, the history of that, how, how the field triage guidelines developed in the first place, uh, the process we went through to uh, update them for this version, and then get into the meat of the update, and then uh, certainly have time for questions. So um, this was a project that was uh, funded by NHTSA, uh, but managed by the American College of Surgeons under, under a grant program. So let me see if I can get the slide to advance. So I think you're all familiar with the trauma chain of survival, just like the cardiac chain of survival. We think that every step in the process of the injured patient is critically important. And that starts with the very first person that approaches the patient, the bystander, and the first aid that they provide, uh, then moves on to EMS care, uh, ultimately to trauma centers and hospitals, uh, and then on to rehabilitation and recovery. But I cannot, cannot overstate the importance of EMS in this process because most trauma deaths occur before patients reach the hospital. So we know that the earliest opportunity we have to really intervene after injury is in those first two circles. And the decisions that are made about where the patient's gonna go can have significant impact on their outcome. So the whole goal of, of the trauma system is to get the right patient to the right place in the right amount of time. And EMS is absolutely critical to that process. Now, the American College of Surgeons has a long history. In fact, we celebrated our 100th year of the Committee on Trauma last year, which was quite a, quite a milestone for us, um, in setting standards and in developing um, strategies to really uh, uh, work towards what we consider the optimal care of the injured patient. And the first standards came, back, came out uh, back in 1976. And even in the initial standards, which were really set for hospitals, right, starting to develop trauma centers, starting to think about how hospitals organize their care. Even in the early standards, there were guidelines for EMS to think about when should you bypass a local hospital to go to a more advanced trauma center. And that has been a cornerstone of the trauma systems as they have evolved. This is what a trauma system looks like today, in our mind anyway. Uh, it has uh, pillars of uh, activities and in injury prevention and in education and training and data and performance improvement and best practices. And those pillars really span every step again in the process of care. And you can see again that the EMS agencies, both air medical and ground are critical in this process of deciding where the patient goes and then in moving the patients between hospitals as well. <clears throat> so this is our vision of a trauma system and we have to make sure that we have the best evidence base to support our decisions at each step. There is good data in the literature that says that trauma centers and trauma systems save lives. Uh, this is a landmark paper uh, written by Ellen McKenzie and others, uh, really uh, doing a national study of the, oh, it's advancing on its own. Sorry about that. 
a national study of the impact of trauma care and, and being cared for it with serious injury in a level one or two trauma center has a 25% decrease in the risk of death can being cared, cared for in a non-trauma center. That's huge. There's not too much in medicine we do that has a 25% improvement in survival. And then this is additional data looking at uh, motor vehicle crash mortality in trauma systems. So uh, states develop trauma systems at different times. Uh, we have no national trauma system, so all, all of this has been developed at the state and regional level. And this is a nice paper looking at the impact on motor vehicle crash mortality in states as they developed trauma systems. And overall, there was a 13% uh, reduction in motor vehicle fatalities. As you can see, some states had a very dramatic effect uh, in reduction of motor vehicle uh, fatalities as trauma systems were implemented. And this is back in, to, in the two, this was study was done in 2000 and most trauma center systems were implemented really in the early 1990s. So this is what our uh, trauma center distribution looks like today. So you can find this interactive map online uh, and the little pins represent hospitals. Uh, and you can, the red ones are level ones, the orange are level two, the greens are level three, blues are level four. And then there's a few states like mine that have level fives even in the rural areas uh, and those are purple. And you can see that we have large areas of the country that there's very few trauma centers. And so long distances uh, for EMS to travel uh, to get to a major center. And then there are other areas where states have been very inclusive and have included a lot of uh, level three centers. And so you have to make decisions every day about where, which is the right hospital to take this patient. Sometimes there's no choice. There's only one and it's the, you know, and that's where you're gonna go. But in many cases you have a choice as to what level of trauma center you're gonna take the patient to. And that's what the triage rules are all about. And I think it's important to put this in the context of injury prevention. We've done a tremendous amount of work in injury prevention to really take a multifaceted public health approach. This is what's called a happy matrix, which this one particular one is for motor vehicle injury. And you can think about all the things that we've done in these different domains to try to reduce the rate of injury before it ever happens or to lessen its severity. But an important part of injury prevention is also the post-event care. And that's where trauma systems come into place. So the history of the field triage guidelines, the, the first uh, one that looked like it was a, a true guideline was in 1987. And that was developed as a, as a scheme that was a stepwise decision-making. Uh, it was then updated in 1990, 1993, 1999, and all of those were done by expert consensus. Expert consensus is a bunch of people sitting in a room with a, with a good beer, right? So uh, not a lot of evidence going into that, but we think this is a good idea. And here's what we're just gonna come up with some agreement. In 2006, this process was taken over by the CDC uh, and again, funded by NHTSA at the time. And they put together a multidisciplinary panel and really did the first evidence-based review of this tool. And this was published in the MMWR in 2009. And then a panel came together in 2011 to update it. And that's the part version you're probably most familiar with. And that's the, the image that you see there. It was a stepwise decision scheme. You Step one, you would think about uh, before you're going on to step two and so forth. And, uh, and this was widely adopted uh, really in most trauma systems across the US. I blew this up here so you can see it a little bit uh, more, more closely, but in the 2011 decision scheme, step one was about physiology so if, or mental status. So if the, if the patient's hypotensive, they've got altered mental status, not breathing very well, they should probably go to the highest level trauma center available to you and you don't have to go any further down the algorithm. Uh, step two was about uh, anatomic injuries, you know, you can see the bone sticking out, you can see you can see the deformity. Okay, that's a bad problem. They should go to the highest level trauma center available to you. And then step three, which was probably the most controversial step and required a lot of, of uh, research to support it, was around mechanism of injury. So uh, certain mechanisms of injury, as you know, carry a high risk of severe injury, which may not be obvious. The patient may not be hypotensive yet. They may not have an obvious anatomic injury but their mechanism is so severe that they probably need to be cared for in a trauma center, but it may not need to be the highest level trauma center. So this is how the scheme was set up. And then there was a box of step four, which was kind of like things to think about, special considerations and, and things to think about unique populations like the elderly and, and children. One of the things that I think was 
really critical in the implementation of the 2011 version was that it required some pattern recognition. You recall that like in the mechanism criteria, there's very specific things like intrusion more than 12 inches in the occupant site. Well, I don't know about you, but every time I rolled up on a, a motor vehicle crash, I never pulled out a ruler to measure the intrusion in the car, right? So uh, a critical component of that implementation was thinking about how do we recognize these patterns? So I had the opportunity to do some research earlier in my career uh, that was funded by NHTSA through the SIREN project. The SIREN project was focused on really understanding how injuries occur in motor vehicle collisions. So what we did was we enrolled patients who came to the trauma center who had serious injury, got their consent to go out and reconstruct the entire crash, look at the vehicle, map the damage, pull out the ruler, measure the intrusion, and map the injuries that the patient has to the damage in the vehicle. So you can absolutely figure out exactly how many inches of intrusion this way. And that's the data, a lot of that data is what was used to develop the 2011 version of the rule. But it's not that practical in implementation. Unless you teach people to just look, let me see if I get it to advance, inside the car. And I think you can pretty much see here that the patient, where that patient is seated, their pelvis is going to be trapped between that intrusion of the door and that raised center console. And that uh, we published a series of papers on showing that that increases the severity of your pelvic fracture. And so uh, thinking, and, the, and the, if you measure it, it's 17.7 .7 inches here. So it would have exceeded that, that triage criteria. So I think thinking about as we create these um, algorithms, which are based on evidence, how we're gonna actually implement them in the field is critically important, right? We can't expect people to get out a ruler. We have to say, you know, trust your gut and look at this and say, hmm, this patient's pretty high risk for a pelvic fracture. Even if they're not shocky yet, uh, I should probably take them to a higher level trauma center because they might uh, start to get shocky. So NHTSA uh, recently uh, released its National Roadway Safety Strategy for 2022. Um, and one of the things that they highlighted in this is the importance of post-crash care uh, in it, as an injury prevention component. And so they're making a major focus on this, which is perfect timing for us to roll out these triage uh, rules because uh, NHTSA is supporting this implementation uh, across the country. This is a nice... Uh, infographic that came out of that 2020-22 uh, roads uh, safety, which I thought was pretty striking uh, because uh, as they're talking about post-crash care, they note that 20% of trauma deaths are potentially preventable if they can get quicker care and two out of five patients are alive when responders reach them, but die before they reach the hospital. So again, an opportunity for us to think about how we organize our system to optimize this level of care. So what, what, what was our approach uh, for the subsequent revision? And, I, and it really was a 2021 revision, so that's my typo at the top. <laughs> but like uh, the CDC process, we pulled together a steering committee um, and a national expert panel. And the expert panel was very diverse. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had front-end uh, EMS providers, EMS clinicians, uh, EMS physicians, emergency physicians, trauma surgeons, pediatric surgeons, nurses, EMS medical directors, you get the idea, educators. So it really was a diverse group of, of experts from across the country. And before doing that, we sort of said, we need to make sure we have the evidence in a way that it can be thoroughly reviewed. So two years in advance of pulling together the actual expert panel meeting, the steering committee started meeting and designed questions that needed to be answered through systematic literature reviews. Systematic literature reviews are the best way to really pull together what is known on a topic and analyze it in a, in a way that makes sense. So uh, we looked at the existing triage tool and we said, we need to understand what's the new literature in the field since 2011, which was the last time it was updated. So we're really looking at 10 years worth of, of data. We wanted to look at controversial aspects of the, of the guideline. We wanted to make sure that we had opportunities to not only look at the existing criteria, but to identify new criteria if there was evidence to support that. And we wanted to be able to rate the quality of the evidence. So we thought about the different steps. 
And we thought we need to look at the physiologic criteria again. We need to know if we're using the right thresholds for blood pressure, for GCS. We need to look at the mechanism criteria because those were highly controversial and changed significantly in the last versions of the tool. There really wasn't much controversy, honestly, about anatomic injuries. Like if it's broken and you can see that it's broken, it's broken, right? I mean, so other than wording in the in box two, there wasn't a need for a, a really a, a intensive literature review there. And then we really thought we needed to dive into that box four because there might be some stuff in there that, that was in there as a suggestion, but now there's more evidence to change its position in the algorithm. So, so really we thought we needed to do quite a bit of groundwork before bringing this expert panel together. So we went about and commissioned five systematic reviews. Uh, uh, these, these were done uh, by the uh, Oregon Health Sciences Research Center, which uh, won the contract from NHTSA to do the, to do the systematic reviews. They did an entire review looking at motor GCS versus total GCS, um, because you can think about uh, there's um, operational utility. If we could use motor GCS over total GCS, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have to pull out a pocket card to remember just total GCS, like it's like not intuitive, but motor GCS is pretty straightforward. Uh, they did a, a detailed review of the circulatory measures uh, and looked at over 114 different studies to, to look at our our thresholds for blood pressure and heart rate. They did another review on respiratory measures. Uh, and then they did, uh, oh, sorry, uh, then they did uh, two additional reviews that we specifically asked them to do before reviewing the guideline, one on the mechanism of injury and the special considerations, and then uh, one looking at the overall guideline performance, because there had been a number of researchers that had looked at how did the 2011 guideline actually perform overall? And then how did it perform in specific populations, particularly pediatrics and geriatrics? So suffice to say, we had a whole lot of evidence, uh, which was organized in a way that the, that the expert panel could review it. The other thing that we were thoughtful about, and I think this is new to this revision, was the idea that we need to make this user-friendly. Right, whatever we come up with, it can't be something that works in a hospital and doesn't work in the field. And uh, Craig Newgard, who was one of the members of the steering committee, had done some creative work in the past, kind of looking at uh, uh, how decisions are made in the field. And a lot of it was made based on EMS judgment and kind of gut feeling rather than following a structured algorithm. So we felt like we needed to be conscious of the fact that not only should we look at the individual criteria that that previously were in all these different steps, but we should also look at how is this tool being used and how could it be maybe thought about differently to make it more user-friendly. To get that feedback, um, we felt like we needed more than just the few EMS providers that we had on the panel. So the EMS subcommittee of the American College of Students Committee on Trauma developed a, a 40 question, we had to call it an end user feedback tool, it was really a survey, but we weren't allowed to call it that. So, so a 40 question end user feedback tool was distributed through 29 national organizations that represent all aspects of EMS. And we got a great response. We got responses from nearly 4,000 EMS clinicians, frontline providers, giving us feedback on the existing 2011 guidelines and how, it's, how they're used in the field. And this, was, this data was presented to the expert panel and was absolutely used in our thinking about the structure of this um, algorithm moving forward. The other thing that we wanted to do was look at how we were gonna make decisions in an objective way, right? Because again, this is you, you throw all this evidence at a panel, it's still expert opinion unless you have some structure in which you're gonna make decisions. In the 2011 guidelines, the process that they used was something called positive predictive value. And I don't wanna to get too far into the statistics because they're painful for me to think about at this time of night. But uh, they decided in the 2011 guidelines that if you had greater than a 20% positive predictive value of a ser serious injury, that was enough to add a criteria to the, to the guideline. But the problem with positive predictive value, the statisticians tell me, is that it varies with the prevalence of disease or the prevalence of the event. And so it's not a consistent metric. And so it was probably not the right statistical approach, not to criticize the CTC, but I am going to criticize them a little. It probably wasn't the right statistical approach to making these decisions. So we got some smart statisticians to figure this out. 
uh, who, are, who are really experts in predictive analytics and in guideline development. And we wanted to develop a consistent criteria for both adding criteria to the algorithm, what's enough evidence to say this is important and we should include it, and what's the evidence for removing something from the guideline. What we set along were two metrics. One is called likelihood ratios, and the other is the uh, uh, receiver operating curve that I'll show you in a minute. Basically, likelihood ratios tell you how likely is it that what you're seeing is going to predict some outcome. And in this case, outcome is serious injury or need for uh, trauma center care. And there's and most triage studies have either looked at injury severity score over 15 as a marker of serious injury or a composite outcome that includes, oh, they needed blood transfusions, they needed emergency surgery, they needed to go into ICU, those sorts of things that would suggest they need a higher level of care. So these likelihood ratios were fairly prevalent in the literature to help us help guide us. And the, the higher the number, the more likely the effect is, or the greater the effect is. The other thing you can use uh, is the receiver operating curve. Uh, that basically tells you how good is something at predicting something else. So for like a diagnostic test, you know, how good is this test at predicting that you actually have this disease? A perfect perfect test is, is like a 1.0 when nobody has a perfect thing. So an AUC of 0.9 is pretty good. An AUC of 0.5 is like flipping a coin. Uh, and so we basically uh, set some criteria around uh, what would be an acceptable uh, AUC to, to predict a, uh, that, the, that the, the threshold should be there. So in general, our, our thought, thinking was that the individual triage criteria are specific relatively insensitive, uh, but we want we want rather have a little bit more over triage than under triage, right? Under triage means you took the patient to the local hospital when you should have gone to the trauma center and the risk there is they die. That's not good, right? Over triage is, well, you took them to the major trauma center and they weren't quite as sick as, and they didn't, you know, as, as, as they could be. And so maybe a few more patients went to that over other center. Yeah, it can be a problem in some systems, but for the patient, it's best outcome. So in thinking that way, we thought we should have a fairly high bar for removing existing criteria um, and set a threshold for adding new criteria. So this is, these are the statistical definitions. Again, not gonna weigh on it too much, except to say that we had a pretty standard approach and we looked at all the evidence in this way. And if something had a large, or moderate effect, we definitely added it to the algorithm. <laughs> like that's, there's good data there. That had a small effect, we discussed it, but if it was not unreasonable, we put it in the algorithm. Uh, and we only removed it if it had a, a evidence that the effect was low or there was uh, inadequate data. So this expert panel finally came together uh, in April of 2021. We had a two day virtual meeting. Uh, and then we came back together in June of 2021 to kind of refine our thinking. And then we sent this out for a tremendous amount of feedback. So before it was ever finalized, the algorithm went out to all of the participating organizations that had represent, representation. We got feedback from the leadership of all the EMS organizations. Uh, and we, we took that feedback in, in play and iterated on it until we were at a place where we could get approval from all those groups to endorse it. So that took a fair bit of time, as you can imagine. And then we got the final product. So I'm gonna talk through now <laughs> the new 2021 triage guidance with all that background uh, 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 for you. But I think it's important to know how much thought, I think, and, and, and work went into really trying to get this right. So as you recall, the original guideline had always been organized in this stepwise fashion ever since 1976, it had been thought, you should think about the physiology, then you should think about the anatomic injuries. And you know what? That's a great strategy for a hospital, right? Because in my hospital, I have like all this help. I have nurses and people to take the blood pressure and I have, they can stick them on the monitor, they can do all this. So I get this data really fast, right? How long does it take me to get a blood pressure in the field? It's not the first thing I get, right? So I don't have that information in box one right away. What I have when in the field is often box two and box three. Box three is I roll up on the crash and I see what see what the crash looks like, right? 
or I see, oh, this fallen from a really high height. So I might know box three before I know box two. Well, what do I do with that scenario? Like this algorithm was built for doctors. It wasn't built for EMS clinicians, right? And so that was a lot of the feedback we got in the stakeholder format. So we said, well, maybe we need to rethink it. Maybe we need to put it in a format that fits the flow of data to an EMS clinician, right? We got quotes like, I see the rec before I see the patient. I see the patient before I know the blood pressure, right? So this idea that we were gonna make people walk through these steps probably didn't make a lot of sense. So we changed the whole format, which was kind of stressful for me, I have to say, when, when they told me we wanna blow up the, the algorithm, my stepwise thing, like I've been living this stepwise thing for my whole life, right? Um, but actually it makes a lot of sense. And we, we, we crunched it down to basically red criteria, which are bad things that should take you to a high level trauma center. And then yellow criteria, which are things that put you at risk Right, but they're but they're not like immediately you have to go to the highest level trauma. So you probably need to be in a trauma center. It doesn't have to be the highest one. So we really sort of reimagine this format and we change the order of the boxes. So instead of physiologic being the first thing, the first thing is injury patterns. If I see, and I'll go through what's in these boxes in a minute, but if I see a really bad injury pattern, do I need to go any further? Like, you know, there skull is caved in do i need to know make any other decision making like i'm going to the trauma center the highest level trauma center right and the next one is the vital signs and the mental status and we spent some time trying to make that simpler uh and then we put down in here the mechanism of injury and then we took that special considerations thing and we called it what it is it's ems judgment because ems judgment is very important if you're an experienced EMS clinician and you have a gut feeling that this is not good, you should go with your gut. And there's actually studies that prove that. The challenge is this has to work for every EMS provider, whether you're the first person out of school or you've been doing it for 30 years, right? So we tried to put some factors in this EMS judgment box that would help guide that decision-making. So that's kind of the thinking and how it's structured. So this is the, the move from this you go one, you go two, you go three, you go four, two, you go, do I have red criteria or do I have yellow criteria? Okay, so you're reading like a cross now. And we called the anatomic criteria injury patterns because that's really what they are. We updated the physiologic criteria, which I'll go through, kept mechanism of injury, and then these are things that EMS should think about. So this is how you read the flow, risk, highest risk at the top, flow of information to EMS follows the flow that you get the data. This is a whole thing. Don't try to read it. It's way too small. I'm going to highlight uh, each thing, each box, and we'll walk through it. Okay, so let's start with the red criteria. So the red criteria, again, these are things that are high risk. The injury patterns really didn't change all that much. That was box two previously. These are pretty much the same criteria. What's new in here is we added, if you have active bleeding requiring a tourniquet or wound packing with continuous pressure, you probably should go to the higher level trauma center. That means you've got significant bleeding, right? So, so that's, that's the new, newest and only, new, only additional thing that was added to this box. The rest of it was just kind of reworded to make it a little simpler to read. And there's, of course, evidence to support this as we've seen emerging use of tourniquets in the civilian community we have data to support their value as a discriminator. Okay, what do we do with the physiologic box? Well, first of all, we realized that like one size does not fit all, which I think everybody knew, but, but we wanted to operationalize it a little bit. And we said, there's probably some criteria that you can throw at, throw at all patients. So uh, we switched from the total GCS to the motor GCS. So the total GCS is out, say, say goodbye. I'm really happy it's out. Uh, motor GCS much easier, and motor GCS works pretty much everybody. Works whether you speak English or not. <laughs> it works whether you're a child and you can't, uh, you know, can't uh, can't speak, but it, you can follow commands. So, so uh, unable to follow commands, motor GCS less than six uh, puts you into that. I'm concerned about you box. Uh, respiratory rate pretty much works for all ages. Uh, respiratory distress or need for respiratory support. So if you're ventilating the patient, 
pretty obvious, right? Um, we added pulse ox because there's actually data now that suggests that, that hypoxia uh, is a pretty, in this setting of injury, you know, not medical condition hypoxia, but in the setting of injury uh, is, is a significant sign of significant chest injury. And then we divided the, the uh, age groups into trying to make simple things that you could remember. And we added the shock index. So there's been a, a lot of literature looking at shock index, uh, which is basically heart rate over blood pressure. Um, and uh, shock index is, a, is, is an earlier predictor than, than hypotension of compensated shock. But we wanted to not have you do math because doing math in the field is, you know, nobody wants to do the math and figure out exactly what the shock index number is. But if you say, is the heart rate greater than the blood pressure, then your shock index is bad. So it's, it's uh, really simplified that use of the shock index. So these are the changes. Again, going to motor GCS, adding the pulse ox and clarifying the shock, in, shock index, which doesn't apply to children, but applies to anybody over the age of 10. All right, now the uh, yellow criteria uh, here, a lot of the mechanism stuff stayed the same because really the evidence uh, that supports the high-risk car crash uh, data that was developed uh, prior to the original uh, iteration and hadn't changed a whole lot. What we added was some things to make it a little bit more sensitive for children because it, there was some pretty good uh, studies that showed that the previous tool did not work well in discriminating severely injured children. They don't, you know, they don't have bad physiology until that's the last second of their life, right? Um, and so there are some mechanisms in children that we need to pay more attention to. One was the unrestrained or unsecured car seat. Um, and I, how many guys you've seen the, you know, the car seats flying around inside the car? Um, those kids need a little bit more attention. Uh, we added back in uh, extrication or entrapped, um, uh, extrication for entrapped patients. So if you just have to pop the door to get into the car, that's not trapped, right? But if the patient is actually pinned, that's a pretty good sign that they have enough intrusion to meet the criteria, right? So you don't have to think about the ruler, but the fact that they're, they're pinned in the car uh, means they probably need a uh, higher level of care. Um, we changed, this used to be just about motorcycles, but we recognize that there are lots of other transport vehicles that you could be separated from, like your ATV or your horse or whatever. So we, we changed that a little bit. Um, and then this fall was a pretty significant change. It used to say over 20 feet or over 10 feet and children are two to three times the height of the child, which again, who's going to measure the height of the child and try to figure out two to three times, right? Um, the data really looks like if you fall more than 10 feet, uh, regardless of your age, you're at risk uh, for injury enough to go to a trauma center. Again, this is not the highest level trauma center, but, but going to a trauma center if it's available to you. And then uh, in the EMS uh, judgment box, um, we put the, some of the lower, some, some sort of things to think about, lower level falls in really small children or in older adults, because we all know that ground level falls in older adults can put you at increased risk of significant injury, particularly if you hit your head. Uh, particularly if you're on an anticoagulant. So those sorts of things were not strong enough to really clearly define to put into the mechanism box, but they're things that we think should be thought about. Obviously, suspicion of child abuse is another thing you would think about. Boy, should this kid be seen in a, in a trauma center where they have the resources to deal with that? Um, pregnant patients, burn patients, and so forth. So uh, uh, Importantly, we categorize what used to be called special considerations as EMS judgment, because that's really what it is. And, and we should give it uh, credit for what it is. <laughs> so again, these are the new, uh, new additions. Uh, and uh, the last thing, that this is the thing that people get hung up on the most, at least if you're a trauma medical director, uh, is where you should take the patient. This actually, these recommendations, these transport recommendations, <laughs> oh, don't want to switch you to read it, I'm going to tell you. Uh, have not changed. They're not new. Uh, this is exactly what was in the previous guideline. Uh, so if you are a red patient, uh, what it basically says is you should go to the highest level center available to you within your regional trauma system. And every regional trauma system has to figure out for themselves what that looks like. And you know, people will draw lines. If I'm here, I go there. If I'm here, I go there. And then some places it doesn't matter because there's only one hospital you go to anyway, right? Um, but in general, if you're in a red box, you've got a pretty significant injury and you're going to need to be seen quickly in a higher level center. And then the yellow box basically says, similarly, 
You should go to a trauma center if one's available to you, doesn't need to be the highest level. So again, we organize this by risk of injury. The transport recommendation, recommendations align with that risk. We recognize, and we put this in the paper, uh, that no one size fits all. This has to work in Montana, it has to work in New York City, right? <laughs> how, does, how do we resolve that? We expect the local trauma system to sit down with their EMS providers and these rules and figure out how they wanna just do this, just make these decisions. Because I can't tell a hospital in Montana is gonna be the same as, as the situation in New York City. Now, the goal is that those with the highest risk criteria end up in the highest level hospital that's available to you. So the highlights uh, in the revision, uh, it's a totally new structure, new format. Um, it's revised uh, with feedback from EMS to reflect the flow of information to EMS. Uh, I think it's more consistent with how the guidelines were being used anyway. Um, it was a rigorous process. Uh, we used all the evidence uh, that was available in the literature uh, to make these decisions. Um, and the risk categories aligned with the recommendations. And importantly, I think, this is the first attempt at this revision that's really taken this much end user feedback, right? There were always EMS providers on the panels, but that's one or two people you know, speaking for the entire EMS community. At least we had in this, in this venue, we had 4,000 providers give us feedback. So what now? <laughs> we're on a dissemination tour uh, and, uh, and we've developed educational tools uh, which I'll give you the website link in a minute, are, are available to you. So you can have all the slides and you can give a presentation locally on this to your own providers. And then there are case scenarios that you can go through to, to sort of work through the decision-making. And we've worked to develop quality metrics because we think whatever we do, we want to be able to measure, is it working, right? We want to study this guideline compared to the previous guideline and see if it's performing better. So we've been on... We've done press releases, we've done social media stuff. Uh, we presented, we did present, it says we hope, but we did present at EMS World. Um, we've been in a lot of the trade journals um, and all of the EMS professional organizations have been helping to disseminate this work and all have endorsed it. Um, this is just uh, some work we've done with uh, the National Registry. Um, uh, we've uh, at the request of some states, um, had the CDC put on their website that this supplants the 2011 guidelines because the CDC is no longer interested in this. So they're not updating it anymore. So this was meant to supplant the 2011 guidelines. And so we have that uh, statement available for you. Uh, on this website, uh, which is at www.facts.org, and if you just go there and you Google field triage or whatever, um, you will find all these materials free, to, free for download. We want EMS educators to take this material and help us disseminate it. Uh, the they're, they're educators uh, within our group develop these scenarios. They can be customizable from rural to urban. Um, and they're developed, they're, they're a mod, there are some that are developed for just people that are brand new, like this is the first field triage thing they've ever seen. And then there are others that are developed for people who are used to the old system and want to be updated. So you can take it either way. Um, this is just an example of what the case scenarios look like. Uh, we've included you know, lots of good pictures, actual discussion points. So it's really laid out for an educator to, to just plug and play it um, and adapt it to your own system. And, uh, and, and those are up there and fully accessible. For the quality metrics, we partnered with the National EMS Quality Alliance or NEMSQUA. I think that's a cool name. Um, uh, they uh, have developed three candidate measures to help us kind of assess the tool. And now we're working with NEMSIS uh, to put the data in that will allow us to assess those metrics. So ultimately it will be built into the NEMSIS data set as data that you normally submit anyway. And then we can go back and look at it and see uh, how the tool is performing. Uh, these are the three uh, metrics that we're looking at. Uh, one is around the percentage of EMS responses that meet the state, meet the criteria and are then transported to a trauma center versus a non-trauma center. Uh, one is looking at uh, patients that meet those, those first two uh, 
criteria, uh, high risk criteria, which previously were called step one, step two. Uh, and then uh, the third is looking around um, uh, uh, level one and two versus not level one and two centers. So higher level versus lower level centers. Uh, I'm going to end there. I'm going to leave this slide up because this is the website, um, again, where you can you can download the algorithm in color. You can make flyers, posters. We have pocket cards. We have all kinds of things that you can hand out. Um, and we have all the training materials there as well. Uh, it was a fun project to work on. Uh, to me, it was, you know, one of those things that I had to live by when I was a paramedic. And um, it's reassuring to me to, to see how much thought and evidence has gone into the most recent version of it. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and really want to just thank you. And I want to thank uh, Mary McSwain and the whole uh, foundation for the opportunity to share this with you tonight. So thanks very much. Eileen, thank you so very much for putting this all together. I think First of all, everybody on here should understand that uh, Dr. Eileen Bulger was paramedic Eileen Bulger well before she has done all of this. Um, and I think the important piece when you put down EMS judgment, uh, there's a civil war, sorry, a, a war of Northern aggression, surgeon, um, Marriott, you know, uh, Nicholas Sen was actually a colonel in the uh, in the north, um, and he founded a, a, a wonderful um, military surgeons organization. But I think his quote highlights the importance of those who are going to make these judgments, and the reason why all of this has come to pass. His comment was. The fate of the wounded rests in the hands of the one who applies the first dressing. So EMS is so critical in this process. And I'm hoping that there will be some comments from our EMS colleagues online um, who make this work. But Eileen, thank you for an excellent, excellent talk. Um, if I may again. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are certainly honored, honored with your with your presence and with your talk. Um, I have a question, real quick, though. I mean, as I was a paramedic, um, nurse, nurse practitioner, I worked a lot with administration, mainly as a EMS liaison um, and incorporating um, or incorporating EMS into the whole patient continuum. As opposed to EMS being treated like the redheaded stepchild, which it always has been. Um, so how, I mean, clearly through this study, you found that it was necessary to bring more EMTs involved into this process. W what would your advice, again, with you being a paramedic and now as a, a trauma surgeon, your advice to, to um to helping EMS become more a part of the patient continuum as a whole, what EMS can do, what the hospitals can do? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, Mary. And I think that, um, you know, we have to think about the trauma system as a whole and, and it only functions well if, the, if every part of it is working well and it's integrated, right? Um, and I think, you know, what I've tried to do as a trauma director is incorporate uh, my uh, local EMS providers into my trauma QI, you know, so review cases together, um, which is a great way to also to get feedback. You know, you don't want to drop that sick patient off and never know what happens to them, right? So, so developing a relationship with the hospital so that you're part of the quality improvement program, that uh, that you're getting feedback on your patients uh, and what their outcome is, um, and that we can, uh, you know, talk through um, if there are challenges you know, how, how to make things better. I think um, many trauma systems like mine also have a regional QI committee. So we have, a, uh, our state is divided into different regions. Uh, my region is, is King County, which is the largest, uh, most populous county in the state of Washington. Uh, and all of the hospitals that are involved in the trauma system, along with the EMS leadership, meet on a regular basis to talk about cases across the county. So a patient is injured at point A, 
they go to hospital B and then they get transferred to me, maybe, maybe the, you know, was that the right sequence or should they have bypassed hospital B to come directly to me? And we can, we can work through those decisions in real time. So I think um, just trying to find that level of connection and engagement is probably the best strategy. And, and maybe as an organization, we can, with the communities that we go to, we can, um, we can try and, and help facilitate that. Mr. Mercer, Steve Mercer, I think you had some questions. Hi, yeah, and actually, I just want to make a, um, I want to comment on what Dr. Bolger was just talking about here, especially with the QI groups and everything. Unfortunately, sometimes we see hospitals hide behind HIPAA uh, with uh, the reason for not sharing information with EMS providers, which I think is really um, a, a travesty of the idea that the, you know, that information is relevant to those EMS services that have provided the care to that patient. And it is information that can be shared with them in regards to that. Um, now, as you know, on the second thought of that, you know, when you're talking about in your regional meetings and everything, there are some things that you have to blind in order uh, for that. But one of the things that I think uh, from an EMS perspective in uh, other years is EMS does not see that continuation of care once they hit the hospital. And again, you know, I want to go back to um, MTAP's um, uh, mission statement, you know, from the streets to the trauma suites uh, in there. And I think that, again, this is one thing that can help move that along in that same fashion uh, in there and do what we know needs to be done. And that is um, um, we're all part of a team and being a team member in there and being accepted as a team member in there, regardless of whether you're the, the surgeon, the ER physician, the EMS provider, the first responder uh, that showed up there and how important that is for the uh, understanding of what goes on for the uh, ultimate goal of the, of the uh, trauma patient. Uh, in there and what they receive. So thank you for um, uh, for bringing that forward again. The other thing that I think that um, that you mentioned on that I that I want to make a comment and I'm uh, having been involved with some of the development in the past and everything is I'm finally glad to see that the critical thinking process or what we refer to now as gut reaction uh, in there are feelings in there uh, is that it's getting noticed in there and that it's not just another checkbox uh, in between there. Um, I, I think that's one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest things I've seen come out of this version of the uh, field triage guides, uh, and there is that recognition. And I think that that recognition comes to another um, <clears throat> question that has come up in here is um, most of the stimulus to the thought change uh, that was brought in by the group to increase the number of VMS providers on this um, project that you did uh, in this revision. Yeah, I mean, I think. I think like most um, most uh, of medicine, the idea of how you uh, develop and implement guidelines is evolving. And, uh, and you know, we do a lot of uh, this in the trauma community. We write a lot of algorithms and protocols and, and processes to try to standardize care in the hospital. And what we've realized is that you can write the best guideline in the world absolutely best guideline, absolutely evidence-based, scientific. But if it's not implemented, <laughs> it doesn't do any good, right? And so the whole concept of implementation science is really an evolving field of, of, of study to think about how you not only create guidelines in a way that's scientifically sound, but that they're practical and that they can be implemented by those who are supposed to use them. So in that framework, we said, wow, we really need feedback on the people that are using the guidelines now. What's working, what's not working, you know, and, and, and the world has evolved so that we can do more virtual and we have more connection, you know, um, to, to disseminate these things. And so I think that was a, a really a, a stroke of genius from some of our younger folks who said, you know, let's get this out there and let's get feedback before we make changes. So we know that what we're gonna do is gonna be uh, feasible. To implement. And another comment on the educational uh, aspect of it and everything too, that I think um, how critical it is and how important it is for us to understand that in the educational process, we have to make sure that all of the members are involved in the educational process. It doesn't do any good to teach EMS the field triage guidelines if the hospital receiving facilities do not understand that process in there as well as the other team members in between there. So it's got to be a, um, you know, it's got to be a, 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 an all players and not 
not part of the players and everything. And I know that we have some trauma nurse coordinators on here tonight and some other um, physicians and everything that I think it's important to carry that message out there that everybody has to understand um, what it is that each one of them is doing in order to understand uh, or in order for this to be effective. As you said, it doesn't do any good to create something that only one person uses and then it becomes a, of no value. Yeah. I think the other thing that's important is to recognize that these are developed based on evidence in the pre-hospital space, based on, um, on, on and designed for EMS to use. In the past, many hospitals have taken these criteria and just made them their activation criteria for trauma team activation, right? Because it's easy. <laughs> and so I've, a lot of the feedback I've gotten as we publish this is, well, I don't want to activate for every one of this. Well, that's okay. You don't have to. These are not trauma team activation criteria, right? Uh, they are EMS decision making, thinking about where to go criteria. But what, how you choose to activate your trauma team might be different. Now, the physiologic criteria—they're pretty good for trauma team activation, you know. <laughs> but, but I think that understanding why and how a thing is developed, and then if you choose to adopt it for something else, that's fine. But you need to know that that's not how and why it was developed. And I think that's there's been some on the hospital side, some confusion about that. You know, I, I think that I think that's a great point. And the other thing on that is is you know it is it, it does kind of give you a framework in there based on what the resources are available in the receiving facility uh for them to look at some of their uh activation criteria. And I'm sorry Dr. Gross, I kind of jumped in there. It's all right. I'm used to it. <laughs> Yeah, whatever. <laughs> no, it's whatever. Um, it's from my granddaughter. Uh, the the other thing that I think is the beauty of these field criteria, and I think Eileen had mentioned it earlier, is that they're not set in stone. And the ability to take the, for instance, I'm on the Connecticut EMS Medical Advisory Committee and I sit on the Connecticut Trauma Committee. Both of those groups have taken these criteria, these this field tri triage criteria, and they've now adopted it to a state that is just <laughs> maybe twice the size of Rhode Island. You know, three and a half million people, and that's all we got. Uh, these two committees have worked these triage criteria and adopted it, adapted it, so it fits our local environment, one. Two, I think an important piece, as you were mentioning, Eileen, of involving EMS, I think it starts in the trauma bed. When we start giving our EMS providers their 20 or 30 seconds of time out, they're now invested. One. Two, those same medics can now be invited to an m and &M or a peer review conference, or one of the trauma surgeons goes out to that EMS provider, to that organization, and has a meeting with all of those EMS providers at their monthly meeting and reviews cases. They're now invested. And I think that that is how you get the two groups to work together seamlessly and very little effort because everybody has a piece of the pie. Yep, good. As we get closer here towards uh, our ending time, I would just want to take a couple minutes here. I don't want to end it, but just to uh, make a couple announcements while everyone's still uh, online here is um, our next uh, third Thursday trauma talk or the T4 uh, will be on May 18th. And the speaker is going to be Hank Meyer. And he's a, a lawyer, an ATF agent and a SWAT medic in New Orleans. And he'll be speaking on EMS and the crime scene preservation. And then if we jump ahead to the month of June, on uh, the 15th of June, uh, Dr. Allison Smith, a uh, board member of the McSwain Trauma Foundation, she will be speaking on uh, hemorrhagic shock, not the only shock in town. So again, um, if you'll mark those down on your calendars, uh, again, it's uh, June 15th for shock. 
And on May 18th is the uh, EMS and crime scene preservation. These will also be uh, listed on our website and registration is same as what you have here um, as you did this evening uh, in here. And again, as always, uh, we want to thank you for your time for attending this evening's um, presentation. Dr. Bolger, I can't begin to tell you how much uh, we appreciate what you what you have provided for us here this evening uh, in there. And um, hopefully we'll uh, continue to see you in some future presentations here. And everyone else, that uh, all the participants, thank you for your time this evening uh, in here. If you need verification of having attended this conference or, or this uh uh, webinar tonight, please uh, contact us by email and we'll uh, give you verification for proof of attendance in that. Um, and again, with that, I'd like to open it up to any other additional questions. Uh, if there are any questions, again, uh, from the audience members, always please feel free to use the chat feature um, in there and we'll kind of hang here for a few minutes and answer any more questions i know that we're just a couple minutes over the hour but we'll still we'll uh stay here for a few more minutes and um continue on with with the conversation if needed steve i'm looking at the chat um i don't see any other conversations or no. any questions um so perhaps we will let eileen take a breather yes she did I, 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 on a very personal level, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. You and I both have a mutual love and admiration of the individual for which we are sharing our time together for all of us. Um, and to have you with us tonight, uh, I got no words. Thank you. And on a personal level, on a very personal level, I will echo, um, um, Dr. Gross, your being here um, means the world to me, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for keeping this conference running. And please put me on your list. I'd love to attend in future ones. Absolutely. Thank you so Good much. Thanks very much. Have a great night. Good Bye. night. Thank Good night. you. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and uh, end this evening's uh, presentation. Roger thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Eileen. Good night. Thank you. And...